Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're going to allow a little bit of time for more people to join the call. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. I'm Andrew Sorensen, spokesperson here at CU Boulder. I'll be moderating today's call. Some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is focused on students and families. Next week on Tuesday, April 6th, the campus Q&A will focus on faculty and staff. If you have a question for the experts on today's webinar, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. You can start doing that now. Please note we're prioritizing questions today from students and families. We will do our best to get to all questions. If we do not get to your question, you can reach us at colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. If by chance we run out of questions prior to the scheduled ending of the webinar, we will end early. And as a reminder, today's call will be recorded and that recording will be available on our COVID-19 website. On today's call, we have Chief Operating Officer Pat O'Rourke and Provost Russ Moore. We're also joined by Catherine Eggert, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Planning and Assessment, Jennifer McDuffie, Associate Vice Chancellor for Health and Wellness and Head of our Pandemic Response Office, Commander Mike Hyatt, uh, Mark Hyatt, apologies, of CU Boulder Police, and David, Devin Kramer, Acting Dean of Students. Now I'd like to turn it over to CEO O'Rourke for some opening comments. Thank you, Andrew. First, I wanna thank our audience and our panelists for making the switch to a Wednesday webinar rather than Tuesday. Changing the date enabled us as a campus to be able to support the memorial service for Boulder Police Officer Eric Talley, who as I'm sure you all know, gave his life responding to the King Super shootings on March 22nd. I also wanna thank the campus community for the way that it rallied to support the Boulder community in the wake of the shootings that took 10 members of the community from us. Our CU Police Department responded with bravery together with the Boulder Police Department in the immediate defense of those in danger. And in the days since, so many others have demonstrated care and compassion. I wanna give very sincere thanks to our mental health providers, student affairs team, human resource specialists, and so many others who we've already asked time and time again during the pandemic to step up they have it so again, they've gave selflessly of themselves and I'm really grateful for their willingness to do it. I also want to acknowledge that this week marked the beginning of another historic event, which is the murder trial arising from George Floyd's death almost a year ago. His death provoked many important conversations on our campus and beyond about race and justice. And I know that for many members of our community that this is bringing up feelings that are very challenging at this time. It's also in the wake of uh, the experience that happened in Atlanta that claimed the lives of several Asian Americans at a time when reports of violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are on the rise, creating an increased sense of insecurity, fear, and worry about personal safety in the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Right now, coalescing as a campus to support one another is critical. And we are encouraging and will continue to encourage our students, faculty, and staff who are experiencing grief, sadness, anger, frustration, 
and a sense of loss to seek support through campus resources, including our Counseling and Psychiatric Service Office, the Office of Victims Assistance, and the Faculty and Staff Assistance Program. It's also important to remember that during these times, people will process grief differently. We've asked supervisors to be flexible, faculty be, fle be flexible in how they work with students, and for everybody to be caring and kind to each other during a very difficult time. We've endured much during the past year, and none of us will emerge and change. But we and the city of Boulder will work to recover together. Right now, we're setting our sights on finishing the semester as strong as we can, looking ahead to the summer and to next fall semester, which we are hoping to offer a much revitalized CU experience built largely upon in-person instruction. As we finish this semester, we're continuing our investigations from the riot that occurred on March 6, and there are more than 50 active student conduct referrals. We'll be continuing to follow up on those investigations, and we're going to continue to expect that our students will engage in conduct that is for the health and safety of our community. Our progress on the investigations has been slowed somewhat because the police investigators who had been assigned full time to work on the investigations have been asked to assist in the investigation of the King Supers murders. That is taking the priority for the community and police even resources at the moment, but we will return to those and we will make sure that we're following up and taking actions to address the riot that occurred. As we turn towards the fall, we're informed by the guidance of our pandemic response office and our faculty experts. We believe that the progress of the vaccine rollout will make a transition safe for more in-person instruction, more in-person events in the fall, and we will continue to monitor the public health guidance and adjust our plans as needed to make sure that we're maintaining health and safety. But by the summer, we expect that there will be enough vaccine supply available so that every adult who wants to be vaccinated can be vaccinated. We're conservatively estimating that before the beginning of the fall semester, at least 75% of the campus population will have immunity to COVID-19, either through vaccination or through prior infection. And we anticipate many incoming or returning students as well as new faculty and staff may want to obtain a vaccine. And we plan to offer it in the fall as long as we're able to maintain our vaccine supply. The question has arisen from multiple constituents about whether we will require people to take the vaccine. And at this time, all of those vaccinations are under emergency authorizations, and there's no requirements to get the vaccine at this moment. But we're continuing to evaluate the legal implications of whether or not to require the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as the ethical implications. In the meantime, as we make those determinations, we're encouraging our campus community to get the vaccine and are offering it through our campus medical services. Boulder County itself remains in level yellow and a move to level blue is not imminent. CDPHE released COVID dial 3.0 last Wednesday, March 24th, and we're going to be seeking further clarity on what this means for our campus community. We also know that Governor Polis announced yesterday that everyone age 16 and older is eligible for the vaccine starting this Friday. All Coloradans over the age of 16 will be eligible to receive the Pfizer vaccine and all Coloradans over the age of 18 will be eligible to receive the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It's important to know that we are receiving some supply of vaccine on the campus, but that there are also community resources and that the state will probably be setting up large vaccination uh, sites over the next several weeks. And so people should, if they have opportunities to receive the vaccine outside of CU, to be open to those opportunities as well. The state's mask public health order is set to expire on Sunday, but we believe that that's most likely going to be extended. We also believe, we also know that the Boulder County mask mandate is still in effect, and we expect people to follow it as long as it remains in effect. As Russ and I said in our message on Monday, our planning for the fall has begun with the following. Unless required by state or local orders, we plan to not offer surveillance testing in the fall due to widespread vaccine availability. 
but our medical surveillance team will, or our medical services team will continue to offer diagnostic testing on campus. This will include testing for symptomatic and asymptomatic faculty and or asymptomatic faculty and staff. Symptomatic faculty and staff should consult with their primary care provider. We'll also continue to do contact tracing and case investigation so that we're able to follow up on any cases that arise. Our campus COVID-19 health and safety policy will remain in effect, but we're going to continue to update it for the fall as public health orders change. We plan that more employees will be returning to campus this fall in support of the student in-person experience, and university leadership will be working to provide plans for their specific units. Until those plans are in place, employees who are currently walking, working remotely should plan to continue working remotely, but also should continue to consult with their supervisors. The campus and individual units will continue to provide updates on the fall semester in the coming weeks as we continue to work towards opening up as much of the in-person buff experience as we can for our students. As we move forward, we're gonna to continue to optimize ventilation and air filtration through our HVAC systems, as well as to use enhanced cleaning protocols in our buildings. I'm really thankful for everyone who has made it possible for us to be able to begin this transition to the fall and to be able to offer the full experience that we want on our world-class campus. If it hadn't been for the efforts of the campus community, to be able to practice safe COVID practices, to be able to engage in social distancing, wear masks and do the things that will keep our community safe, we wouldn't be in this position. Over the next several weeks and months, we also wanna be in a position where we're doing what's necessary in order to be able to protect the campus going forward. So please continue to follow state, county and campus public health guidance so that we can all be safe and continue our educational journey. More details about the fall can be found on our fall 2021 webpage. But for the moment, I'd like to turn things over to Provost Russ Moore that, so that he can provide some additional updates as well. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. I wanna echo what Pat said about the campus and Boulder communities. It's truly impossible to draw a line between where each begins and ends. We're intertwined and interdependent. Our faculty, staff, and students have been devastated by what happened on March 22nd and have joined with Boulder residents and people across the nation in mourning. I want to pay tribute to them for the hard work and perseverance they've shown in one of the most difficult years in CU Boulder's long history. Today, as Pat said, we're looking forward to a fall semester that we hope will make our university experience and our community stronger. We announced the return to fall, a fall schedule on Monday, and you can get all the key dates by visiting our fall 2021 webpage. First, I'd like to reiterate that the majority of our courses will be in person. Across campus, we expect the total number of usable classroom seats to increase significantly. Most classrooms that are less than 100 students and have movable furniture will be close to pre-COVID capacities. Classrooms that seat more than 100 students and classrooms with fixed seating will have lower densities. Some larger lecture classes will continue remotely because we will be maintaining three feet of distancing in the classroom, which impacts the capacity of lecture halls with theater style seating. Departments offering multiple sections of the same course are working to designate some of those sections for remote mode to provide flexibility for our students. We continue to adjust room assignments and class times for the fall, and we appreciate your patience and flexibility during the registration process as tweaks do occur. Students will know the instruction modes for their classes when they register with classroom assignments anticipated in late May. By late May, the meeting times of some in-person and hybrid in-person classes may need to be shifted based on classroom availability However, the class instruction modes will not change. Continuing students will be able to add, drop, or swap a class uh, if needed through mid-June, as well as during the schedule adjustment period in August. It's important that students not assume that they will be able to take all of their courses online or remotely unless they're in an online degree program or have a documented need requiring such an accommodation. The class schedule for fall 2021 was just published on Monday, 
and students will start to register next Monday, April 5th. They'll be choosing from classes that are over 70% in person, about 10% hybrid in person, with the remainder of the courses being remote. Class offerings do always shift somewhat over the summer as we cancel classes with low enrollments, add sections of classes with long wait lists, and sometimes have to change class times if there are difficulties finding good, good rooms for the classes. Current expectations are that there will be enough vaccines available so that all individuals who want to be vaccinated can be. As Pat said, a conservative estimate is that 75% of the campus population will have immunity to COVID-19 either through vaccination or prior infection by the beginning of fall semester. Given this estimate, current models show that even with reduced social distancing within our classrooms, the risk of transmission would be extremely low. Through extensive contact tracing, we have yet to identify a single case of in-class transmission of the virus. Class meeting patterns will remain the same as the 2021 academic year with 20 minute passing periods to reduce hallway densities. Residence halls will be near full capacity with some spaces reserved for isolation. Dining facilities will continue to offer a variety of dining options for residential students with a continued focus on healthy and sustainable food cho choices. We will continue to offer order ahead options for students convenience as well as serve meals. We anticipate opening more spaces for in-person dining, including some dining areas while staying in alignment with the county and state regulations and COVID-19 framework this fall. Incoming students who have confirmed their intent to enroll may now apply for on-campus housing. Student life activities, including sports clubs, intramural sports, and other student programming will return to more traditional in-person opportunities as allowed or within the county and state's regulations for the COVID-19 dial framework as we enter the fall. Decisions about events, athletics and large gatherings will be made in accordance with evolving public health guidance. And again, more details about the fall can be found on our fall 2021 webpage. And now I'll turn things back over to Andrew. Thank you, Provost Moore, CEO O'Rourke. At this time, we'd like to invite all of you to ask your questions to any of our panelists. If you have a question, please use that Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. First question up, uh, question here for Devin Kramer. Will only first-year students be allowed to live on campus next fall? Hi, all, and thanks for having me today. Um, so our on-campus housing is primarily for first-year students, but we do have some spaces available for our returning on-campus students, our transfer students, um, and other return, returning students, um, and that's in our Bear Creek apartment complex. Um, that application opened back in February. Um, students can still apply, though, to live in Bear Creek and will be placed on that wait list. We also have off-campus housing and neighborhood relations, and they can help students find off-campus housing um, throughout, throughout the year. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, question for CEO O'Rourke. Will the campus require vaccinations for students, faculty, and staff to be on campus? Other public universities are requiring the vaccine. Thanks, Andrew. And I'm aware I saw, for example, that Rutgers University announced that they were going to be requiring vaccine for their population. We're continuing to look at this question. Um, right now, we know that it's under an emergency use authorization. Some of our people who work in bioethics have told us that that should be something that we consider as we determine whether or not to move forward with any type of mandatory vaccinations. And so I can't give a solid answer to that as the, at the moment because we do wanna be able to look at what the legal requirements are as well as the ethical requirements so that when we move forward, we're on very solid ground. We are, however, strongly encouraging everyone to take the vaccine. It's something that we know can be protective of not just the campus, but also the community. And that if we do that, it really does become the key for us being able to return to 
uh, campus experience in the fall where we'll be able to have the type of in-person, not just educational experience, but also the events and co-curricular activities that we know that our students and the other members of the community wanna, want to have. Thank you. And this one is either for Pat or for Jennifer McDuffie. For new students that arrive in the fall, we will be offering vaccinations, especially for non-residents and international students who may not have been vaccinated yet. Jennifer, could I ask you to jump in on that one? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone knows that um, as vaccine supply increases, our hope is to be able to offer a vaccine to anyone who wants it. So in the fall, as we have students who are arriving on campus, they would be offered the eligibility to get that vaccine. All right, thank you. Uh, another question for Jennifer here. The plan for club sports is to be guided by county and state guidelines in the fall, which means as of right now, they should be allowed to play. So how can members of club sports feel the university will stand by this guide? That's a really good question. It's also a really challenging question as we have recognized that the guidance has recently changed. So as it relates to club sports for the fall, there are a few things that we will follow. We'll follow federal, state, and local guidance, as well as national governing bodies. Most of our club sports are affiliated with a national governing body that has given recommendations, as well as set some parameters and expectations. And so I encourage anyone who's interested to contact our team sports uh, leadership, and they are happy to have some conversations about what that future looks like. Great, thank you. A uh, question for our student affairs folks on the line or potentially Catherine Eggert. When are study rooms in the new Leeds Rostandi extension going to be open? With more students on campus, the quiet spaces are becoming harder to find. With masks and distance protocols, why aren't they open already? And perhaps this is a good opportunity to talk about uh, you know, some, of the, some of the expanding study room areas across campus as we look towards fall. I can take that one, Andrew. Um, thanks for the question. We, uh, I don't have any information, I have to say, about the study room specifically in the new Leeds extension, um, the bridge between Leeds School and uh, the College of Engineering. But I can say that we are continuing to expand our study options and students can go to the website, uh, find your study spot that they can search for that, find your study, study spot on our colorado.edu website and reserve a space where they will be guaranteed to have that time for some peace and quiet to study. Thank you. Another question for Jennifer McDuffie, will the vaccine be available for students quickly enough so that both doses can be given before students return home? This person says, I'd like to try to prevent the issue of having my student getting the second dose in a different state being an out-of-state student? That's a very uh, good question and planning is gonna be really challenging, especially as we get closer to the end of the semester. Each week we do um, ask for a certain number of vaccines and the state lets us know what we receive. And it's something that we really want to encourage um, anyone to get depending on the type of vaccine. And in Colorado, there are three vaccines that we're able to apply for. And we are considering first and second dose timing. So please know that when we're reaching out and letting um, our students as well as our faculty and staff know about appointments, um, that the second dose is something that we have to consider, whether that's 21 days, 28 days later, or if it's Johnson & Johnson, it's not even applicable. So we're doing everything that we can to pay attention to the calendar, as well as travel schedules and um, encouraging as many people as they can to also look at other clinics in the area that may be able to support them and their needs um, based on their timeline. All right, thank you. Uh, question here for Pat. Will you continue on campus testing in the fall? Uh, will testing be required for both on and off campus students? I think you answered that a little bit uh, in your opening remarks, but if you wanna to touch on that again. 
Yeah, so in the fall, um, we probably will not need to do surveillance testing unless there's a requirement for us to do so, either from the state or some other or a, other public health authority. What we would really be moving to that more is to be using diagnostic testing uh, in of PCR testing rather than surveillance testing um, based upon what the current disease burden is in the population. Thank you. Question for Provost Moore. Can you elaborate on the fall schedule being mostly in person? Is that a guess or can we count on it? Uh, you, you can count on that. Uh, so as of two days ago, uh, we had very specific uh, uh, data on how, how many courses would be in person, how many would be uh, uh, hybrid, remote, and in person, and how many uh, solely remotely. Uh, that, that was about 71% uh, in person. That number, by the way, in the last day is trending up. Uh, so that's the only direction that's going to trend. So I can give you my assurance that at least 71% of our courses will be in person and perhaps more as things change over the summer. Uh, but those those data are pretty, pretty hard and uh, fixed in there. Okay, thank you. Question for Devin or Jennifer, where can students go for help following last week's tragedy in South Boulder? Thanks for that question. Um, so we have a lot of resources on campus, for faculty, staff, and students. I'll answer for all. Um, so for faculty and staff, um, the faculty staff assistance program is, is the place to go um, if you want some direct clinical, um, direct work with a clinician. Um, for students, they can go to OVA, our Office of Victims Assistance, or they can go to CAPS, Counseling and Psychiatric Services. Um, and to find those, you can go onto our website and just search FSAT, OVA, or CAPS. Um, another thing I wanna draw your attention to, we have a webpage focused on um, traumatic events and working through those. You can find that webpage at either any of those three websites and I'd strongly encourage you to go look there as well. Thank you, Devin. I also want to encourage everyone um, not only to look at those clinical services, but also be mindful of the small things and how it can make a very big impact. Go outside for five minutes, check in on a friend, reach out to a colleague, say hello. The reason why that's really important is so many of us process at different times and whether you need it now or you maybe need someone to talk to in six weeks, we're gonna be here for you. I think it's also important that we note for our counseling and psychiatric services, we have drop-in appointments every day. You do not need a schedule. You do not need an appointment to come in and they are virtual right now. We also offer unlimited group workshops. We often get asked a question about wait times there's no wait for drop-in services longer than a day. We wanna be able to support you, but recognize that there's other things that you can do as well. We have our peer wellness coaches, our, <clears throat> pardon me, our peer wellness coaches will reach out and talk with you, whether it's about sleep or stress or relationships. We're having a lot of relationships conversations this spring. We have our E Let's Talk series where you don't really have to have anything to talk about, but just drop in and, and listen or say hello to an advocate um, who's there to support and to have a conversation. So I hope that throughout these services and throughout these options that you all know that you're not alone and there's not a timetable to this. We're gonna be here today and we're gonna be here tomorrow and in six months. Thank you for that. Uh, another question for you, Jennifer. When and where can CU students get the vaccine? Is there a website to sign up for an appointment? Yes. Um, and as of tomorrow, I'm kidding, as of April 2nd, I thought today was Thursday, my apologies. As of Friday, April 2nd, um, anyone is eligible. But please know that we do have a large portion of our population that does have um, medical conditions um, and has not been vaccinated and eligible for some of the previous um, phases. So students can go, um, as well as faculty and staff, and sign up on the COVID-19 website 
there's a vaccine interest form. From there, we'll connect um, that contact information with our communications partners and let you know when vaccines are available. Just to let y'all know, um, we have a lot of access and service and support. The clinics that Pat mentioned earlier um, will also be on the website and we're trying to partner within the community to make sure that anyone who wants a vaccine can get it, whether that's here at CU or through some of our partners in the county. Okay, thank you. Uh, question for CEO O'Rourke. Currently all buildings on campus require Buff One card swipe access Will that continue throughout the summer and into the fall semester? So my, I hadn't thought of that yet. Um, so I need to, to be honest about that. Um, what I anticipate is that as we return to more normal operating status, that we will need to also look at access to buildings and other things to determine whether or not it would be safe for us to return those also to a less restricted status. That buff card access was designed in order to be able to make sure that we were reducing the amount of social intermingling between groups um, and trying to reduce population density. So if the conditions that prompted the restrictions access have been abated, I think that that's something we have to review. Okay. A uh, question for Provost Moore, Catherine Eggert. How about teaching and research labs? This will affect undergrad and graduate students. Will they return to labs that are three feet apart as uh, the lecture halls are gonna be in the fall? Yeah, I wish there was a really simple answer to this one, but let, let me try to provide the simplest but most honest answer. Um, so first of all, I want everyone to know that we are continuing with our enhanced air handling systems uh, in all our classrooms and laboratories as appropriate. That uh, enhanced air handling uh, capacity uh, alongside with um, our modeling in terms of what is necessary to prevent transmission of the virus or vastly mitigate the transmission of the virus is done on a case by case basis, depending on the space in which those laboratory activities are occurring. So what I can do is provide assurance that uh, any research lab activity or any uh, teaching lab activity, uh, the, the distancing and, and the safety uh, protocols necessary to conduct uh, things safely will be dependent on just a, a, an individual assessment of spaces in which those occur. So the answer is probably yes with an asterisk on it. And the asterisk is everything that I said right uh, before. Uh, Catherine, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll add that the uh, facilities team that has been working on classroom capacity has analyzed all of the teaching labs and uh, working with the departments that use those labs, they've determined the safe capacity for those classrooms. I believe the three foot distancing uh, in the teaching labs uh, pretty much puts the teaching labs back to normal capacity that is pre-COVID capacity in most cases. Thank you very much. A uh, question for Devin here. Will registered student groups be able to meet using facilities on campus? Will masks be required on campus? And I think uh, Jennifer McDuffie, you might have uh, some answers to that as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of reg registered student organizations, we are planning to return to more normal activities next semester. Um, we'll follow, of course, federal, state, and local guidelines. Um, however, if space is available, we're hoping that we will um, have space for those RSOs. Um, in terms of masks, uh, I'll start and Jennifer, you can, you can finish. Um, campus policy has been designed to really focus on public health orders. So right now, um, if public health orders are saying that masks are required, um, they certainly will be required. Um, that's something though, you know, we're gonna have to consider as, as we move into the fall um, and we will make sure to clearly communicate what those requirements are. Great. Jennifer, anything that you wanted to add to that? No, Devin hit it spot on. Um, I'd also like to say, you know, as we talk about masking and hygiene and other things, um, it's really important that we continue to look at the positives 
uh, that we've learned in terms of um, virus spread from this and look at how best to keep our community safe um, outside of just the, the requirements um, that we currently have. All right, thank you. A uh, question here for Jennifer and Pat. Uh, you might want to tag team on this. What is the rationale for limited seating capacity for larger rooms to keep that three foot distance when the estimate is that 75% of staff and students will be vaccinated? Uh, this person goes on to say if two people are vaccinated with a 90% efficacy rate, uh, the possibility of either person being infected with COVID is a low percentage. So we agree that there's been there's low percentage of risk um, in the classroom environment and the measures that we've taken throughout the course of this year have been effective in being able to reduce transmission. How we were able to formulate those standards was by relying upon not only the public health experts in the community, but also with our own scientists and faculty. In consulting with them for the planning for the fall semester, they have recommended the three foot hexagonal physical distancing within the classroom as being in the measure that is most likely to allow us to be able to increase the in-person capacity without increasing the risk in our classroom to a point where we would not be able to confidently say that we're doing what we need to do in order to be able to maintain the, the highest degree of safety in the classroom environment. As a, a non-scientist, I can't speak to the aerosol transmission itself, um, but we want to be in the position where we're relying upon the expertise of our faculty and following the recommendations that they've given us to be able to ensure that when we return in the fall, we're doing it the right way. Absolutely. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything to add there? Nope, okay. Uh, this appears to be our last question again for Pat and Jennifer. Any discussions on marching band at football games or is that all pending state and local regulations? Will there be any plans for restrictions to be lifted if the rates continue to go down and or are minimal? So I'll take the, the first shot at that, which is that there has been special guidance that has been in effect for intercollegiate athletics. As we saw both in the fall and in the winter through the basketball season, those have been very restrictive on the type of environment that you're allowed to be able to offer athletics through. What we anticipate is that we're already seeing with some of the professional sporting organizations, for example, the Rockies have announced that they're going to be returning more fans in person. We also know that the Avalanche and the Nuggets have announced that they're going to be able to have more fans in place at the ball arena in the weeks ahead. So that guidance for those organizations is continuing to change. We can't put on events at Folsom Field or Coors Event Center that aren't compliant with public health guidance, but that's one of the areas where there has been evolution and that as the evolution occurs, we're going to continue to incorporate that, not just for our athletic events, but for the other events that we host on campus. It would be my hope that we would be able to get to the point in the fall where if there are games at the stadium and we're able to have a greater contingent of fans, we would also have the other things that support that experience, including the marching band able to perform. But until we actually get that guidance from the state for intercollegiate athletics, um, we have to say we don't know, but we know what we want to do, and that's to be able to make sure that not just in the stadium, but across the campus, we're giving people the outlets that they have to be able to enjoy all of the university experience. All right. Jennifer, anything to add there? Okay. 
Well, again, we want to advise everyone that we're taking a slightly different approach to our weekly webinars this semester. We're alternating between the faculty and staff campus Q&A sessions and student and family campus Q&A sessions. Next week on Tuesday, April 6th, the campus Q&A will focus on faculty and staff. The next student and family campus Q&A will be the following week on April 13th. These updates will occur on a weekly basis throughout the spring semester from noon to 1 p.m. Mountain Time, with the last webinar currently scheduled for Tuesday, April 27th. If you have more questions or you'd like to see additional information, you can do so by visiting our COVID-19 website. Again, that is colorado.edu forward slash COVID-19. There you'll find a chat in the bottom right-hand corner where you can ask questions. Boulder County Public Health is also hosting community briefings this year. Those are every other Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. BCPH's agenda at those meetings is to provide updates from Boulder County Public Health leadership, provide updates from public health professionals on current topics, including vaccinations, testing, and data, as well as updates from local partners. Lastly, the City of Boulder does a once a month briefing. Those are on the third Thursday of every month, and those are from 3 to 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Thank you all for joining us today. We will now end the call.